Hello, my name is Frank Harris III. I'm a professor of post-secondary education and co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab at San Diego State. I've been at SDSU now for the past 13 years, and I'm just really honored and excited to be able to participate in this personal cultural narrative project. I'm just humbled that Dr. Zamani Galler and colleagues at the University of Illinois felt that my story and that my perspective and experiences, you know, had something valuable to offer, to offer our field, offer our colleagues and offer students. I'm very excited about this. I guess I'll begin by just sort of starting from some of my earlier childhood experiences. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, in an area of town known as the Ninth Ward. And it sort of reflected on the Ninth Ward, I can say that it was comprised primarily of low-income Black families who had been living there for several generations. While it was a community that was filled with a lot of love and a lot of assets, it was also heavily impacted by systematic racism as evidenced by chronic poverty, drug abuse, under-resourced schools, and so forth. A lot of things that we often hear about and write about as scholars of color. And I would say that the country got a first-hand glimpse of this in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans. And while the entire city was impacted by Katrina, nowhere were the effects of Katrina more harshly felt than in the night. This is where we saw federal, state, and city officials making intentional decisions to focus relief efforts on the more wealthy and the more affluent parts of the city, the parts of the city that tourists were more likely to be attracted to, and really did so while neglecting communities like the Night Ward. And so we saw that, and we can kind of juxtapose that as kind of bringing some clarity or just kind of helping understand how experience living in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans was different from living in other parts of the city. And so, you know, just kind of reflecting upon that experience and growing up in the Ninth Ward, thinking about some of my earliest schooling experiences, it really did have an impact on who I am, my identity, my identity as a person, my identity as a man of color, and ultimately my identity as a scholar. And I'll say that, you know, some of my most formative years were spent in the Ninth Ward. Both my mom and dad grew up there and my grandparents had homes there that they had purchased in the 60s until they were eventually destroyed by Katrina. And um, when thinking about the Ninth Ward and my experiences there, I really think about the matriarch of my family, who was my maternal grandmother. She had her first kid when she was around 15 years old. She eventually married my grandfather not long after that. And she did not have formal education beyond like seventh or eighth grade. And what I can say about my grandmother, while she wasn't a highly educated woman, obviously, but she was incredibly wise and very resourceful. And my grandmother cleaned homes to make a living. So she cleaned homes as, you know, as a housekeeper. My grandfather worked as a janitor, so he cleaned local schools and, you know, local businesses like bowling alleys and movie theaters and so forth. And eventually kind of, you know, was able to have a, you know, a set of steady work that allowed them to take care of their family. Together, they had five children. Before purchasing their home in the Ninth Ward, they raised all five children in the Desire Project housing community. Some of my earliest experiences, some of my, in many ways, some of my most fond memories of my grandmother, my grandparents, is going to work with them at nights during the summer to help them clean homes and help them clean businesses. My grandmother was a real stickler, right? She took great pride in her work. She really did it. And, you know, just found a way to turn what could be perceived as like very humbling work into something that she did with a lot of pride and a lot of dignity. And I think, you know, when I reflect back on that experience, those experiences, I think that that really had an impact just seeing her work and seeing how hard, you know, how hard she worked and how diligent she was. It really had an impact on my work ethic, first of all, but it also taught me how to really value all work, to really value people, regardless of how prestigious the work may be perceived. And it's some of these same lessons that I learned from my grandmother that really shaped my identity as a person and as a scholar. I lived in the Ninth Ward until I was about five years old. It was around this time where my parents made the decision for us to move to Los Angeles. I was the only child, and my parents thought that living in Los Angeles would provide for a better quality of life, you know, better work for them, better schooling opportunities for me. It was my first time traveling on the airplane. And I remember when we got to Los Angeles, we moved in with my uncle, my uncle Larry, he had been living in Los Angeles since the 60s. He had served in the military, so 
he was a veteran and was able to kind of establish a life there. And we lived in a part of town in Los Angeles that is now known as South Central Los Angeles. I don't think it was called that at the time that we lived there in the early 80s. And it was, in many ways, it has some similarities to the Ninth Ward. At that time, it was a predominantly Black working class community. Thinking about most of my schooling experiences in Los Angeles was very interesting. So, you know, around first, second, third grade, and so forth, I was always in trouble. I recall always being in trouble and being sort of frustrated by that because I didn't really understand what I had done or, you know, I just knew I was in trouble all the time. My parents were always being called to school and I was always being kicked out or sent to the office. I mean, I had really developed this identity and thought that I was a bad kid and that school wasn't, you know, the place for me or wasn't a space or a context in which I could thrive and be successful. I, you know, really remember that. And I think at one point my parents just had gotten tired of me always getting in trouble and thought, you know, being parents from the South, they thought that I needed more discipline. And so they withdrew me from the local public neighborhood school and sent me to this private school that had a reputation for being both academically rigorous, but also, you know, instilling discipline. So this is, you know, the 80s where corporal punishment was still, you know, sort of practiced in school. So I remember, you know, getting paddled and getting punished and all sorts of things. And, you know, but what was interesting, I learned a lot and grew academically. From that experience, I still continued to get in trouble. So I was always being punished. I would get in trouble at school and, you know, by extension, you know, get in trouble at home. And my relationship with educators and then, you know, just the whole context of education, it became very tense and one that I didn't really enjoy or appreciate. I felt like Educators were just like adults who were just here to make my life and make things more difficult for me. That was just what I ultimately internalized. And so I didn't like them. I didn't trust them. I didn't want to have any real meaningful contact or engagement with educators. And it was kind of this way until about fifth grade when my parents made the decision to move me back to New Orleans. They were dealing with some legal stuff at the time. And at that time, it was better for me to just go back to New Orleans go back to the ninth ward and live with my grandmother. And so for the next four years, you know, I, I lived with my grandmother. It was her, it was several of my cousins who lived in the home that my mom and her siblings kind of grew up in. It was my grandmother, it was several of my cousins that lived there and several of my aunts. And so we were all just under the same roof. We didn't have a lot of space. We didn't have any money, but we had something that was far more valuable. We had my grandmother's love and we had my grandmother's guidance. And she was incredibly hard on us. You know, she made sure that we worked hard, that we did well in school. She made sure that we were respected adults and we respected our teachers. She also made sure that we contributed to the household. We had chores that we had to do. We had to cook. We had to clean. That no one got to live there for free. That everyone had a role to play. And everyone had to contribute in a way that allowed us to have a successful and a functioning household. It's probably the best way to describe it. And, you know, my grandmother also taught us the importance of being independent. So as kids, even as young as fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, if we wanted to buy something, then we couldn't go and ask her for money. We actually had to go out and earn the money. One of my older cousins and I would do is we would often mow lawns. We would go around the neighborhood dragging a lawnmower through the ninth ward in the hot, blistering, humid summertime. And we would just knock on doors and ask the neighbors if we could mow their lawn for a couple bucks. You know, hopefully, eventually, we would get enough people to say yes, get a few bucks, and that allowed us to go and buy whatever it is that we wanted to get. My grandmother also really instilled the importance of being resourceful. You know, in some ways, it was about being entrepreneurial, which is interesting because these are values that are prioritized in the academy. And, you know, at the time, obviously, I didn't know that I would eventually become a university professor and I would have to rely on a lot of these same values and these experiences would shape and have some impact on my work today, all these years later. But even, you know, in terms of being resourceful and being independent, if you wanted to go somewhere, if you wanted to go to the mall, or if you wanted to go to the movies, we had to find a way to get there. So usually that meant public transportation. And so those four years from the time I was about nine or 10 years old until I was, you know, my early teenage years, until I was about 13, really, really had an impact on my identity and who I was. And also at the time, you know, just thinking about my schooling experience living in the Ninth Ward and how it was vastly different from my experience in Los Angeles. 
you know, in the Ninth Ward, so first of all, everyone went to the same schools, right? The whole community did. And all the public school teachers were Black, and all of the students were Black. I mean, every single person, the administration, the teachers, the students, I mean, it was pretty much an exclusively Black space. And that was in elementary school and in middle school, actually. And, you know, many of the school teachers there had been teaching in the community for 15, 20 years, sometimes longer. So some of these same teachers were the teachers that they had, in some cases, my parents in classes or, you know, my aunts and my uncles. So there was this sort of kinship and this shared connection. The teacher knew every kid's family and knew their siblings. It had some connection beyond the fact that they were just students in their classroom. And I think what happens is there was just this very deep and unyielding commitment to Black children and the Black community. And these were the first educators in my lives that I can recall that told me I was smart or that told me that they expected great things from me. And it really, in many ways, changed my identity, you know, as a student and as a scholar. It ultimately shaped my identity for the rest of my life after that. I began to take school a lot more seriously, and ultimately I thrived academically. After being in New Orleans for about four years, I actually returned back to Los Angeles to live with my mother. By this time, her and my dad had divorced, and this was right around the time in which I was starting high school. My mom had taken a job at UCLA and decided that I should attend Santa Monica High School, which at that time was a predominantly white school in an affluent community. She did not want me to attend Inglewood High School. We were living in Inglewood. And she felt that Santa Monica would be a better school, better resourced, safer from gang violence and things like that. And so that's where I went, starting in ninth grade. After having attended school with all Black kids and all Black teachers for the past four years, coming to Santa Monica was a complete culture shock. It really was. You know, one of the experiences that I often think about that I'll never forget was in my ninth grade health class. The teacher was given a lesson on alcohol abuse, and he asked the students, he asked us to name some alcoholic drinks that we had heard of. You know, thinking about that now, that probably wasn't the most appropriate question to ask a group of ninth graders. But, you know, that's what he asked. And uh, kids started shouting out random things like Cape Cod and Long Island iced tea and all these other popular drinks, things I had actually never heard of. And one kid happened to yell out Black Russian. And I don't know what it was about that moment, but for some reason, I decided to raise my hand and ask the teacher, what is Black Russian? You know, I'm the only Black kid in the class. And the teacher jokingly said to me, you know, like when you go to Russia, and the entire class just erupted in laughter that was directed towards me. And, you know, being the only Black kid in the class, I immediately felt humiliated and ashamed and embarrassed. And, you know, I had a lot of experiences like this, uh, similar experiences like this, not always with teachers, but certainly with other students, you know, during that time. I eventually left Santa Monica High School after ninth grade and enrolled at a neighborhood school. At that time, we had moved from Inglewood to a nearby city called Gardena. And I enrolled at Gardena High School where I would eventually, you know, stay and complete 10th, 11th, 12th grade there. And once I graduated from Gardena, I enrolled at Loyola Marymount University where I completed my undergraduate studies. I had a really, really good experience at Loyola. It was a small school. I was able to have good connections with instructors and so forth. And I eventually developed a relationship with two faculty members, but there was one in particular who really took a liking to me. His name was Dr. Dean Scheibel at the time, and he taught like the research methods class and kind of had this reputation of being a really tough professor, but, you know, somehow for some reason we just connected and, you know, he would often comment on my work and tell me, you know, what a good student I was and how great my ideas were. And that, you know, I really need to think about going to graduate school and so forth. And eventually I made the decision that I wanted to go. He supported me, you know, with letters of recommendations and recommending programs and doing all the mentoring and things that you have to do to get a student to graduate school. And I eventually enrolled at Cal State University Northridge in a speech communication program where I eventually earned my master's degree. That's where I had some of my earliest experiences in teaching. 
after finishing up at Northridge, I started working in student affairs for several years, you know, working in a number of different areas and so forth. And after working in student affairs for a few years, I kind of took a liking to the field and really enjoyed the work that I was doing and decided that I wanted to advance my career in student affairs. In order to do that, I needed to earn a doctoral degree. And so what I decided to do was enroll in the EDD program at the University of Southern California. That's where I was working at the time in student affairs. So it was a program that was accessible to me, you know, in terms of proximity. There was a nice tuition benefit that came from being employed at the university. So I enrolled in the program with the goal of advancing my career in student affairs administration. And it was there where I met two scholars who I credit for shaping my academic career. And those scholars were Dr. Estella Bensimo, who I, you know, eventually hired me actually to work in her center, to work in the Center for Urban Education. So I got to work really closely with her during that time. And I also met Dr. Sean Harper, who had recently come to the university and was directing the EDD program. So Sean, you know, just reached out to me and he and I really connected and he eventually would become my doctoral advisor. He shaped my dissertation and they both had a tremendous impact on my career. They were the first two people to tell me that I had what it took to be a faculty member. I would say up until that point, I never saw myself as someone who the academy would even want as a faculty member, who felt like I had something to contribute from a scholarly perspective. But the two of them really encouraged me they challenged me. They did everything they could to sort of steer my career in this direction. And eventually I sort of gave in and said, okay, fine. Maybe this is something I need to consider. And I finished up my doctorate and went on the job market. At that time, at that point in my life, I was married. I had two children. And so I had some real limitations with regard to, I couldn't just pack up and move across the country or move to another state in order to pursue an academic career. I had some other you know, considerations. I had some financial considerations that had to be part of the decision-making process and so forth. And so I only applied for jobs in Southern California. And even at that point, I wasn't really sure if and how things would work out. I had some uncertainty. I really didn't know if programs or departments would see me as having something to contribute would take me seriously as a scholar. I think part of it also is I had earned an EDD. I didn't earn a PhD. I had a lot of great methodological training. I had a lot of great scholarly training, you know, particularly from working with Dr. Ben Simone and Dr. Harper. But, you know, on paper, I didn't know if I would show well. And eventually I was fortunate to land a position at San Diego State. And this is where I've been for my entire career as a tenure track faculty member. When I came to SDSU, I came here and I was teaching primarily in the master's program in student affairs. So teaching, you know, a lot of the traditional student affairs courses in somewhat traditional ways, I'll say. I was doing research on college men and masculinity. And this was a research topic that I picked up as a graduate student and pursued it as a dissertation topic. I had a lot of success in doing that. I got to share my work, you know, with colleagues at NASPA and ACPA. And, you know, for the most part, I did pretty traditional academic things. I went to ASH and presented my work at ASH. I made sure I was publishing in the right academic journals, the quote unquote right journals. So, you know, Journal of College Student Development and venues like that. And eventually I got to the point where it earned me tenure at San Diego State. And so I would say things were going just to sort of following the traditional path and doing the things that they say you quote unquote have to do in order to be successful in the academy. I did those things. And, you know, I got to the point where I earned tenure and then it was sort of a critical moment, I guess, or a critical moment. But I remember feeling after tenure, after getting tenure, I started to feel very disenchanted. I started to really question the meaning and value of the work that I was doing. I felt a void and just felt like the work that I was doing, it didn't light my fire anymore, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. 
so I started to really kind of think and reflect about that I needed to make a career move. Was it time for me to reconsider and go back to thinking about administration? I mean, I really was sort of at a loss at that point and didn't really know, you know, what to say or what to do. And I would say the year after I earned tenure, my brother, my academic brother, Dr. J. Luke Wood, we were fortunate enough to hire him here at San Diego State. And that was a move at that same time, just my connection with Luke. And we had similar interests as researchers. He was doing work on black men. You know, I had been doing my work on college men and masculinity and so forth, although I was kind of thinking about moving away from that. But we just really hit it off as colleagues and thought partners right away. And so what I eventually ended up doing was I completely reshaped my research agenda. And I really started to leveraged my work on college men and masculinity and started to focus on men of color in community colleges. And this was an area that Luke had done some work in as well. Our interests just really converged in that regard. We started a research center called M2C3, the Minority Male Community College Collaborative. M2C3 would eventually become what is now known today as SEAL, the Community College Equity Assessment Lab. And what that allowed me to do, looking back, is allowed me to kind of re-engage some of my early work on equity. So when I was a graduate student and when I was working with Dr. Ben Simone, I was introduced to these concepts of equity and equity-mindedness and institutional responsibility, concepts that are you know, far more mainstream now than they were then. And the work that Luke and I decided to undertake allowed me to kind of think about and go back to some of that early work, work that I wasn't as deeply engaged in, but working concepts that had a real impact on my epistemology as a scholar. Part of what we did with starting M2C3 is part of being a university professor is you have to get grants. And we would spend all this time applying for grants because we had this new center that we were launching and we really didn't have a whole lot of resources. And so we had to write grants and we would spend all this time writing grant proposals. And almost invariably, those proposals would not be funded. He and I, we sort of joke about this now, but I think the first 12 grant proposals that we wrote were not funded. So we were 0 for 12, like literally 0 for 12 in our efforts to get our work funded and so forth. And so part of what we decided to do, I don't know that this decision was as intentional or as you know, that we knew what we were doing at the time. But we just decided to start working directly with colleges. Not so much to get our work funded, but to just get the work out there. You know, we felt like we had something to contribute. And, you know, the best way for us to do that is just to go and start to work directly with colleges. You know, working with colleagues, so many, so many to name, and just started to kind of work directly with them. And I would say that working directly with colleges, what that does is you start to see immediate impact of your work. You start to see institutional policies and institutional practices change. You start to see people change the way that they do their work. So that really energized me as a scholar, for one. And what it also did is it made me kind of question and rethink some of the more, you know, traditional ways of disseminating scholarship and and applying scholarship. I started to really kind of think and start to question, to be quite honest, you know, some of these more traditional things. So like going and presenting research, a research paper at a conference, publishing a research article in, you know, a peer-reviewed journal, things that you have to do you know, in order to be considered legitimate and in order to have some success and, you know, to be honest, to keep your job in the academy. But seeing how that experience was so much more different from an impact perspective than doing direct work with colleges. Now, recognizing that you still, you know, you still have to do the research in order to have something valuable to offer, right? So it's not about questioning research or the value of research, but really questioning the ways in which the strategies that are prioritizing the academy with regard to disseminating and using research. And so that has led to a lot of partnerships across the country, just doing real deep, intentional 
work around institutional transformation. Really love working with community colleges, first and foremost, because if we're talking about students of color, if we're talking about building communities of color, then community colleges are really at the center of that work because you know community colleges serve a high concentration of students from minoritized and underserved backgrounds and communities. And so I felt like, we felt like I should say, Luke and I felt like if we're really gonna you know, have some impact and be able to really you know, have something to offer that can be value added to communities of color that we really needed to at least start our work and prioritize the community college in the work. And so as I think about that and sort of weave the whole narrative together, there's kind of three lessons that emerged for me that I think is important and valuable to keep in mind. You know, the first is that being a scholar, being a professor, being an academic, being an educator, regardless of how you describe it, is a tremendous opportunity. And with that opportunity comes tremendous responsibility. And so I think it's important to never lose sight or take for granted the opportunity to have a positive impact on the lives of marginalized communities and the institutions that serve them. In my opinion, it's part of our calling as educators, it's part of our calling as researchers and professors. As Estella used to often say, to do research that makes a difference. And I think if we're not doing that, then we're really falling short of our calling and our mission as scholars and educators. The second lesson that comes to mind for me is that, you know, most of us in the academy who identify as scholars of color, who are trying to do transformational work, many of the valuable assets that we bring to our work are our lived experiences. Our lived experiences and the lessons that were instilled in us, you know, from our elders, from our parents, from our grandparents, from community members, from teachers who taught in our communities and who were committed to our communities. And these lessons are not necessarily valued in the academy, but they're very important and they can really make a difference, not only in our own success, but in the larger impact and trajectory of the work that we do is important. And then, you know, I would conclude by saying it's important for us as scholars of color to not measure our self-worth by the standards that are prioritizing the academy. We know that the nature of academia and the nature of the academy has a way of delegitimizing us and telling us that what we do as scholars and who we are as people, that those things are not good enough. I say that we need to challenge that. We need to push back on that. We need to remind ourselves that that's a myth, that that's a misconception. But I also think we need to redefine what it means to be a scholar. I really credit and thank folks like Stella Ben Simone and Sean Harper, even my grandmother who modeled that for me. You know, what I try to do now is to model that and do the same for others. And so, again, I want to thank our colleagues at the University of Illinois for this awesome opportunity to not only share our stories, but to reflect on our stories. I think opportunities like this put us in a reflective space and allows us to kind of think about critical moments in our lives and in our upbringings that maybe we buried or maybe we've forgotten about. People who've made a difference, you know, I think when we do that, it brings a sense of life and appreciation for who we are and how far we've come. So I'm humbled and grateful for the opportunity to do that. With that, I want to say thank you.